Wow, this is fun, isn't it? What a blessing. You know, these, uh, these moments are, it's like, it's a, it's like a, a tidal wave that starts, and you start to begin to feel the effects of it. But the longer you are here, the more you get caught up in, in the flow and in the, in the wake of what the Lord is doing. And the word comes in, and it begins to wash us and cleanse us. And um, I won't ask for a show of hands because all of us have probably dealt with something in our life before the Lord. I know I have. And, and, and now we're getting cleansed, and we're worshiping, and we're fellowshipping, and we're praying. And then we just get to this place, and I imagine tonight it's just going to hit this crescendo of just uh, expectation and just an overflow of what God has done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss being with you tonight. Um, and uh, I really did try. We tried to work it out so that the, uh, what I was invited to do uh, there in uh, Nairobi, that I could finish this and go and do that. But uh, we just couldn't work it out. Uh, one of the elders in our church um, is a, a Kenyan brother. And so he's been trying to get me to come over here for a while. And um, so when he heard that this was coming up, they, they tried to pull this together. So um, I get to go and be with some people from our church, as well as uh, meet a bunch of other people. So I definitely appreciate your prayers. We um, began in Ephesians 3 in our last session, and we're going to pick that up again, but we are, we're definitely going to pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Father, we thank you that you're ministering to us. We thank you that we get to see the trophies of God's grace. Lord, we're all a trophy of your grace. Lord, we pray today as we study your word and as we take it in and as we learn from the Apostle Paul, as we learn from you, Lord, that we will be changed and transformed. I pray that heavy hearts will be lifted. I pray that there will be encouragement. I pray that there will be joy in the Lord. I pray that, Lord, each and every one of us would walk in the power that Paul is going to speak of. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're talking about enduring in ministry. Again, I said it doesn't matter if you are a person who's uh, maybe you're 15 years old in here. And you're like, I'm not in ministry. But you know, if you're a believer, he's given you ministry. He's given you a spiritual gift to use. And you need to be faithful in it. Some of you spend your entire life laboring in the gospel. And we will, you know, this obviously is going to have an application to, to you and to me as well. But the three points that we've covered so far in Ephesians 3 is that Paul esteemed the unity of the church, even in peril, even in difficulty. And this is how we endure. We endure by walking with each other and having fellowship and unity. We are going to endure by having that right perspective. I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am not a prisoner of, my, uh, of circumstances, or I'm not a victim. I trust in the sovereign God. And if you have that understanding of God, then you are going to be able to endure. The minute you begin to think that you are a victim of somebody else's evil plotting and planning, you're done. And we can't do that because we have a God who's bigger than all of that. The third thing that we talked about is that we needed to be faithful stewards, right? That, that imagery of, of having an open hand or a closed hand. We, something has been given to me. It's been given to me to give to you, but it's also been given to you that you might give to her, that you might give to him, that you might give to the world around you. And so we need to be faithful stewards. Now, as we move into this next section, I want to move on down to verse 7. So I'll, re I'll read from verse 3 to 7, and we'll come up with this fourth point, and that is that Paul ministered effectively by the power of God. Let's read. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister 
according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. If we're going to endure in ministry, we need to do it in the strength and the power that God gives to us. Paul didn't just have a proper perspective. That's necessary. But he also was empowered by God himself to go and to proclaim this message in a place where it really it was going to be rejected. There were some that received it, but his life did not end with him being applauded and celebrated. It ended with his head being chopped off. And so he needed this power, but we need the power of the Holy Spirit as well. We want to be effective. I want to be effective for the kingdom of God. And just a side note, let's always check why we want to be effective. Do I want to be effective because that makes my dreams of a minister and ministry come true? Do I want to be effective because I'll have a better reputation? Or do I want to be effective because God has given me a task to do and I want to be faithful and accomplish it? There is a difference. And sometimes it's hard to tell. But if you spend time with Jesus, he'll let you know. He'll let you know whether you have the proper reason and the right motives for wanting to be effective. God has left his servants with the means to effectively do the work of the kingdom of God. We don't come short in anything. Brother, sister, you don't need anything else other than what you have already been given. You don't need another class. You don't have to figure something out. You don't have to figure out the secret that that guy knows or she knows. You have everything that you need for life, for godliness, and for ministry. He's given it to us all. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, those things which are highly esteemed among men are an abomination in the sight of God. Be very careful of esteeming what the world has. Oh, if we had more money, if I had this, I had a better education, then people would respect and they would come. Those things are an abomination to the Lord. So what has he given to us? Well, he has given us prayer. The ability to sit and to call upon God and hear from the Lord on how to be led and directed in ministry. How to be, uh, to pour our heart out in in, in our pain, in our sorrow, and and to lay it before him so that he might minister to us. Prayer. Prayer is so important. I don't think there's probably any believer that would say, eh, don't need prayer. But if we were to measure prayer by our involvement in it, well, now that's a different thing, isn't it? You know, people will come and they will listen to a man preach. But if you want to get that same group of people to come and sit at the feet of Jesus and talk to him, you might get 5% of them. That's not very popular. We need to be People that are praying and waiting upon the Lord. Our pastor, Pastor Chuck, said, get your people praying and keep your people praying. It's a lot easier to get them praying than it is to keep them praying. But we've got to do that. We've got to pull them in. This is what the Lord wants us to do. You read through the book of Acts and you see that they were a praying church. You look at the ministry of Jesus and he got up early and went away before anybody else was up and he prayed or he prayed all night. We need to pray. The other thing that we've been given, and there's been a big emphasis on it, but it's the word of God. You have the word. You have that expression of the intelligence and the reasoning and the heart and the love of God in the Bible. We need to preach that. We need to use that. This is the difference. We also have the love of God shed abroad on our hearts by which we now know how to love one another. This is it. The world will never get that. They will never get that kind of love outside of Jesus. I mean, the world, would you agree with this? The world is angry right now. Man, I look at my country, America is angry. America's mad. America is unhappy. But I think it's around the world. There is an anger. And here we are, the church of Jesus Christ, with the love of God touching our hearts, and we have the ability to show kindness and love to people. They don't get that out there in the world. They can only get that from Jesus, and Jesus will funnel his love through you. We have the gospel, which was just so beautifully declared to us. We get to preach it. Those are our tools. 
And then we have the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you something. Why is it that you have dismissed, if indeed you have, why is it that you've dismissed yourself from walking in your giftedness? What is the reason, young man or young woman, what is the reason why you have decided, I'm not going to be used of the Lord? I think I know what God wants me to do. Every time this uh, request for help is mentioned in the church, I always feel that stirring in my heart, but I'm not going to do it. Why have you dismissed yourself from serving the Lord? Maybe some of you have been in ministry for a while, and you're thinking of dismissing yourself because of various reasons. That Well, we'll talk about a few in just a moment. But why have you dismissed yourself? Well, I'm too poor. I'm too uneducated. I'm too hurt. My life was too sinful. Well, I mean, we just heard of the grace of God and how it changes and transforms. But why have you dismissed yourself? Well, I don't have gifts like that, man. I can't sing like her. I can't, you know, communicate like that. I don't have those abilities. And so we dismiss ourselves from being used by the Lord. There's a story in the Old Testament. It's Numbers chapter 13. You can go read it on your own later. And it's when the children of Israel are coming into the promised land and they, they had sent out spies into the land to see what it was going to be like. And when they, the children of Israel sent out these spies into the land, they saw tall walls and tall men. And they said, we're not going. We are not going to go in and fight. Their walls are too high for us to, to climb and the men are too big for us to fight. And this is what it says. The text actually says this. They say, we were like grasshoppers in our... Not, he doesn't say in their sight. He doesn't say we were like grasshoppers in the sight of the, of the giants. He says, we were like grasshoppers... What does it say? In our own sight. I looked at myself. I looked at the walls. I looked at that man. And I said, I'm a grasshopper. I'm just a little bug that's going to get squished underneath that man's foot. I can't do this. And so they retreated and they were unwilling to walk in. But you know, the, the Lord, he gives you all the strength. He will give you all the power that you need. The Lord loves to choose, uh, loves to use those that are weak and to use those that are powerless. The, if you're like, well, but I'm really powerless and I'm really not gifted, then you're just going up further on the list of God's List of who he wants to use. No, not me. I could never do it. That's exactly who he wants to use. And we have so many Bible stories that tell us the story of Gideon. God used Gideon because he was the weakest man in Israel. When God showed up to him, he says, oh, mighty man of valor. He says, you went to the wrong tribe. You went to the wrong family, the wrong clan, and I am the weakest of everybody. You went to the bottom of the barrel of Israel when you called upon me. And he says, yeah, I know. That's why I'm going to do this. Because when I do this work through you, nobody's going to say, wow, Gideon is awesome. Gideon is amazing. No. He says, everybody knows that you are just who you described yourself to be. That's why you're my man. And then even still, you know how he, he shrunk the army down. So it was just a handful going out to battle against an innumerable host of Midianites. So that God would get the glory and so why is it that you've dismissed yourself? And if you're like, well, I don't know enough, pick up your Bible and start reading it. Get to know the Word of God. But listen, I think all of us will feel like we don't know enough. There's always more to know about the Lord. There's always more to do. So listen, brother, sister, who's sitting on the sidelines and not getting engaged in, in, in using your gift and doing the work the Lord has called you to, enough with that. You know, really, pride, we usually think of pride like this. Pride is, I'm amazing, I'm awesome, aren't you glad I'm here? I'm sure you're blessed that I am here. That's pride. Pride is, is looking at myself and being preoccupied with myself. But if you turn pride inside out, you know what it looks like? I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I couldn't do anything. It's still a preoccupation with who? Yourself. Get your eyes off yourself. Get it on the Lord and, and the tools and the gifts that he has given to us. You know, the church at Philadelphia, the, church, the book of Revelation 
And if you read the Church of Philadelphia, God says, I have chosen you because you are weak, because you have no strength. I've chosen you to be that church that's going to walk through the open doors that I'm going to open up. And so, pastor, if you are sitting saying, well, we could never do something great for the Lord because our church is too small and we are too weak, that's exactly who God's looking for. He's looking for that. If you read it, if you there in Revelation, I mean, it's such a great account. It's Revelation chapter 3. Um, there, the church of Philadelphia, beginning at verse 7, he says to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. I see I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For, because you have a little strength. I've chosen you because you have a little strength and you've kept my word and you've not defiled my name. But how does Jesus introduce himself to this weak church that he's calling to a big task? He introduces himself as the one who has the key of David. What does that mean? Well, the key of David was a, a, a reference to a steward who would go into the kingdom's resources and would open the door and pull them out. In the book of Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 26, you can check me on it, but there was, there was a man by the name of Shebna, and, and Shebna was a man who had the key of David, but he was a selfish man. He made you know, uh, this massive tomb for himself that he would die and live and everybody would remember. He took money in for himself. He blessed himself, and when he died, nobody cared. But then the Lord raised up another one whose name was Eliakim. And Eliakim was a righteous man. Eliakim was just a man, but he was a good man. And it's interesting, as you read through Isaiah 26, it says that he, he will be like a, a, a peg. You know, something that's put into a wall. It's put into the wall and you can hang stuff on that peg. And he says he'll be like a peg, but then he's going to be pulled out. Because every man can only do so much. Every man can only live for so long. And then there's gonna, he's going to pull out of the wall and another man or another woman will step into that place and then the nation or people can hang their hopes upon him because he's a good man. Well, that's who Eliakim was, but he was only a man. But here, who's the one that has the key of David? Is it Shebna? Is it Eliakim? No, it's Jesus. And Jesus is good. And Jesus has access to all the resources. And Jesus will never pull out of the wall. Jesus is always going to be there for us. And so this one says, who has the access to all the resources of heaven, says, I've set before you an open door. But we don't have enough strength. Yes, I know. That's why I chose you. Do you see that? And so often we dismiss ourselves from stepping out because we're weak, because we don't have the resources, because we're not like that church down the road, because we don't sing like her, because I don't have the personality like him to meet all these people. I'm not friendly, I'm shy. And we dismiss ourselves. And yet the Lord is saying, but I have the key of David. I have the key of David. So step out into the things that I am calling you into and leading you into. Listen, I mentioned them already, but let me just give you a quick list of what are not the tools of God's kingdom. It is not money. It is not reputation. It is not manipulation. It is not your anger trying to force people to walk in righteousness. That is not a tool. That is not a tool. And it, we've already talked about this, is not lording over people and demand. None of those are the tools of the Lord. But what he had supplied for Paul was power. Dunamis, something to move. And indeed, that power moved through the Apostle Paul. And let's just ask the question. He said that it was the effective working of God's power. What was the ministry he had? The ministry was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And here we stand, an elderate. We have Kenyans, and you got an American. Gentiles, and a Gentile. So let's ask the question. 2,000 years later, how effective was the ministry of Paul? 
I mean, here we sit because of the effective working of the power of God. Yield yourself to the Lord. Rest in him and watch what he'll do. In Acts 1.8, Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high and then go out and do the work of the ministry. Yes, the work of the ministry is important, but we got to do it in the strength and the power with the tools that he gives us. Nobody wants to see Troy do his best job. You don't need that. The world does not need that. But what the world does need is Troy preaching the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit, just like he needs every one of us. And he's chosen to use us. I, my own strength, my own power, my own personality, it doesn't, that can all perish. But a man or woman yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit working through their lives to walk out in their giftedness, that is needed. That's God's desire. Listen to the words of Paul. It's 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Listen to these words to those of you that have dismissed yourself from serving Jesus because you're weak and you're not very eloquent. Listen to these words. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all that we have that's worth saying. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of, po and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we say, oh, I can't be used by the Lord because I'm too weak and I'm too powerless. And yet that's exactly how God wants to do it. He's not looking for people that got it all together. He's looking for people that understand they need the Lord to work in their life and through their life. The Holy Spirit was sent to the believers to help them in the proclamation of the gospel, to help in walking out the Christian life, to help use the spiritual gifts we're given to edify one another. And the Holy Spirit gives gifts to every single believer. When Zerubbabel was rebuilding the temple in Israel, Babylon had destroyed it, they're rebuilding this temple, and the Lord came to him in this super difficult task, and he says, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He was taking stones and he was putting them together to rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. Well, guess what? We are working on a temple as well, and it's the temple of the Lord, it's, and it's made up of living stones. And the Lord gives us his power to put the living stones together, to, to be an encouragement in the life of the church. And so we have much of the same task. Well, when do I need the Spirit? Probably better to ask, when don't you need the Spirit? If I'm going into a counseling appointment, I can never remember a time when I haven't. Probably have. But I always take a, a few minutes and say, Lord... Give me your spirit. Fill me with the words to say to this individual. May I hear them. May I hear even what they don't say that you want to tell me. Give me the gifts of the spirit that I might minister to them. When I'm teaching, when I'm serving, when we're making leadership decisions, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to do what I think. I want to do what the Lord wants. And the Holy Spirit will do this for us. Too often we fail to accomplish what the Lord wants because we're doing it in our own strength. My power, my flesh, I'll push harder. I'll work longer. And it's, nothing's being accomplished. If that is you, I just ask the question, when is the last time you've been on your knees before the Lord and saying, I have nothing. I have nothing to give to these people, Lord. I have nothing to give to my neighbor. I have nothing to give to my brother who doesn't believe in you. Lord, I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and I will faithfully proclaim the message that is in Scripture. We need to call upon him. Here's the problem. Here's the danger. So I've been in, 
I've been in full-time ministry for, I guess, around 36 years, maybe a little bit longer than that. Over those 36 years, I have prepared, like any, probably anybody else who's been in ministry for that long, I have prepared thousands of Bible studies. Thousands. You know what the danger is of that? I've got this. I know how to do this now. I can figure out this message. I've taught this before. I'm just going to get up there and do what I've done before. That is dangerous. Now I'm trusting in what God has done to me. I'm not in prayer. I'm not waiting for the Spirit to say, say this, speak that, emphasize this. We need to be desperate for the Holy Spirit. We're going to make a decision as a family. We're going to make a decision as a church of a direction we're going to go in. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us the faith to step out in the right direction. Just because I want it doesn't mean I need it. And if I step out to get something that I want and it's not in God's plan, it's not going to be a blessing. It's going to be a weight. And so we, we call upon the Lord. We spend time. Read Acts 13, the first opening verses, where you see the leadership of the church getting together and fasting and praying and waiting upon the Lord. What do you want to do, Lord? I think sometimes our prayer is, Lord, we've got a great plan. We think you're going to like it. We've decided we're going to do this, this, and this. And so now what we really need from you, Lord, is we need to, you to get behind our idea. Wrong. That's not how we do it. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the head of the church. We come before him and we say, Lord, we have an idea, but we don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. And so we wait upon you and we, we fast and we seek your face. Fill our minds with your Holy Spirit so that as we, we talk about the options before us, we'll be able to discern what is of the flesh and what is of the Spirit. Oh, there's not an area of life where we don't need this to be working. So that's number four, right? Is that he endured in ministry because he had the power of the Spirit working through him. And as leaders, we need to make certain that we are calling people to be filled with the Spirit. I, I love what Pastor Ken did last night. He called people forward. They received Christ as their Savior. What's the next thing he prayed for? For them to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, do you believe you should be filled once or twice? Listen, if you're telling me I only get to be filled twice with the Holy Spirit in my life, I'm very disappointed because I need to be filled with the Spirit every day, all day long, multiple times a day. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day of my life. And so to me, this argument, and I get it, I understand the theological argument, but it's such a foolish argument because I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit tomorrow. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit the next day. And all of, the, of, of us are in that same place. So we need to live there. The next point that we see in verses 8 through 12, and this is one that I think is so important, and that is Paul understood the privilege of ministry. L listen to him. What does, he's just blown away. He is like, I can't believe I get to do this. Listen to this. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, to, was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. He's like, I cannot believe that this guy gets to do this ministry. He endured in ministry because he always remembered it's a privilege that he did not deserve. Who am I? I am less than the least of all the saints. I deserve more. Do you deserve more? Why do you deserve more? Who are you? Are you more than all the other saints? Or do you look at yourself as less than all the other saints? And so for Paul, it's like this is a privilege. 
And we can be so excited when we first start stepping out. I'm going to serve in the media team. I'm going to be on the worship team. I'm going to be on the clean team. I'm going to be able to do the youth. I'm going to be able to preach my first message. I get to go out and evangelize. And we're like, I can't believe I get to do this. And then a year goes by. And you're like, those dumb kids. They never appreciate what I do. I don't think the pastor has once said thank you to me. I don't know that I'm going to show up anymore. You know, ah, oh, the media team, we have such terrible technology. I mean, we don't like the stuff that we... And now we start to complain. We start to, to look at ministry, not as a privilege, but as, a, as something that's a problem. Paul warned us to not let the present sufferings of this world ever deter us. You're going to have trials in ministry. Jesus spoke to let, not let the cares of this life Come and choke us out. Jesus gave the parable of the rich farmer who did not realize that his soul was required. All of these things will help us and keep us from failing to see the privilege. You know, think about this. You get to walk in a long line of men and women who have had faith in God and have been used by God. You know, when I think about being in this line of men that know Christ and get to serve Christ. And I love to think about it. There's, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David, these men of God that he used for his purposes. And now I, the baton's now been handed off to my hand. They ran their race well. How do we know that? Because the baton's in our hand. It's in our hand. And this is our generation we look at the world that we have right now, it is our generation. It's to, to bring the gospel to them. And I think that the Lord knew you were going to be alive at this time. And he has you here for such a time as this. But, you know, we can begin to complain in ministry. We begin, the things that we once were just blown away that I get to do, we suddenly begin to have a bad attitude about. How do you view your opportunity to serve the Lord? helping out in the children's ministry, helping out cleaning, evangelizing, whatever it is that you do. How do you view that? Are you still amazed that your hands gets to touch the kingdom of God? Well, I just think I deserve more. Here's the truth. The least of the works of the kingdom of God are still way above our pay grade. You're, I'm more qualified. Listen, listen. None of us are qualified enough to push a broom in the kingdom of God. We need to be humbled. We need to have that low view of ourselves and a high view of the king and the kingdom. And that I get to touch it should be mind-blowing. But we all have those moments, don't we? We all have those moments. We talked about Judas who lost that sense of privilege and we know what he did. So, I've shared this, some, some of you American brothers have probably heard this story before, but when I, when my wife and the team, we planted this church some 30 years ago, and as we were getting ready to go um, over there, I would have these newspapers delivered to my house to see if there were jobs, to see if there was a place, um, a home to live in, and every time I looked at that, that newspaper, I got so discouraged. I'm coming from Southern California. And what they were paying in Lynchburg, Virginia, I was making that as a junior in high school. I'm like, ah, I don't know how this is going to work out. And so I had these newspapers that would come to me in California, 3,000 miles away. And I look at them, and every time I look at these newspapers, it would be discouragement. My wife said, stop looking at those newspapers. <laughs> stop it. God's going to provide for us. And I stopped looking. I, I took her advice. I stopped looking at those newspapers. So then we arrive into town, and one of the things that my, my wife said, she says, you are not going to have to get a job. God is going to provide. And I said, I feel like the Lord is saying that too, but how is that going to happen? We don't know anybody there. There's like three families. How, how are they, they can't support us. And we just said, the Lord's going to do it, and the Lord did that. Until we got into a building project, a little, it was just a small, small, small room. And um, we, we were doing some rearranging, and we ended up the, spending more money than we had. And so I had to find a job 
I had been there two years and hadn't had to work. But now, two years into it, I had to go get a job somewhere, which was fine, but it made me wonder at times, I wonder if this is the way it looks just before everything goes downhill. I wonder if this is how it looks before everything comes to a halt. But, you know, I stepped out and I got a job. Guess what my job was? Delivering newspapers. <laughs> it's a true story. The same company. So these, in America, um, not so much anymore, but used to, people would, would subscribe to have a newspaper thrown onto their yard or put in a box like their mailbox. And so I do this. I don't know, I had like 600 newspapers that I used to deliver. From 3 a.m., had to be done at 6 a.m. And so I was going through and I was delivering these newspapers. And um, I came to the last one. And for something, I don't even remember what it was. I think they hadn't paid me. That's what it was. And I was, I was I go, man, I can't believe I have to do this. And the Lord said, don't ever say that again. I mean, it, it just, it grabbed me. And I stopped the car. And I just sat there and I'm like, I'm sorry, Lord. And this is what he said to me. He says, don't steal my glory. If you complain that you have to deliver newspapers, then you're going to steal my glory. I am a good father. And if this is the way I want to provide for you, then accept it. And don't let anybody ever show pity to you because you are Pastor Troy, the paper boy. And they did call me that, if you wonder. Some still do. And so I was like, all right, Lord. It wasn't, it was the next day I was at church and somebody came up and they said, ah, oh, Pastor Troy, the paper boy. No, they didn't say that. Pastor Troy, we are so sorry. We're so sorry that you have to do this. We feel badly that you have to go get a job. And I said, don't feel bad. I have a good heavenly father and he's providing for me. I do not regret that I have to deliver these newspapers. I, I mean, one day I won't, but it's, I'm okay with it. And, and so please, don't, don't pity me. I'm right where God wants me to be. And you know, I could have developed, if I wasn't for the Lord warning me, I could have easily developed a sense of entitlement. And I would have lost sight of the privilege. I get to serve Jesus. Okay, so I have to deliver these newspapers. Big deal. And you know, this point really came home to me. Um, our oldest uh, child, Tyler, he was probably, uh, wait, how old was Tyler? Nine, ten, with Miss Gilmore? Six years old. So he's six years old, and, and so in, in class, um, they would draw a picture, and they would write like a one sentence. And so we go to this little meeting with his teacher to see his progress, and the teacher takes this paper, and she slides it across the table to me, and she goes, could you just, I'm just curious about this picture and this little story that Tyler wrote. Could you, could you explain it to me? I'm like, yeah, sure. Now, listen, there's only eight words in this story. I take it, and I look at it, and I read it. I'm like, oh, no. How am I going to explain this? And what it said was, the other day, my family was up in the mountains, and I got my shoes wet. Now I have to buy all my own shoes. And, and what the teacher was thinking is, how are you going to make a, this little boy buy his shoes. And, and that is a true story. I, you know, I, I told Tyler, you can go down by the creek. Remember, I'm Pastor Troy, the paper boy. We don't have money. And I said, so you go, do not get your shoes wet. Well, he was in the creek. And he came walking up to me and the bubbles and water's coming out of his shoes. I said, Tyler, I said not to get in the creek. He said, well, I got on the rocks in the creek and then I fell off the rocks. I'm like, you got in the creek. You know, so I said, you got to buy your own shoes next time. Which in my mind meant, I'm going to give you a bunch of chores. I'm going to give you money. Then I'm going to take the money and we're going to buy new shoes. I never did that. But he wrote a story about it. <laughs> How do you think this dad feels in that moment before that teacher with her thinking that I'm not going to buy my child clothes? Like a bad father, that's how I felt. And then the Lord said, this is what you do when you complain about my provision. 
You make me look like a bad father, and I am not a bad father. You rob my glory if you complain about the provision that I'm making in your life and the way I bring it. Your job is to give me glory. Your job, my job is to give him glory, but his job for me is to provide. And however he provides, I must give him glory. Don't allow that sense of awe and wonder and privilege to be lost. Because when you do, it'll wipe you out and it'll also wipe out other people. If God's not faithful to her and she loves Jesus, he's not going to be faithful to me. She's complaining that God's not coming through. God's probably not going to come through for me. And we rob the glory of God. Do you see that? Last thing, and only got a few minutes here. Last thing I want to share with you is um, down in verse 13. He says, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. (laughs) The guy in prison is speaking to the church to not lose heart because he's in prison. Is that the way you would write it? Or would you say, hey, I'm not, you know, I'm trying not to lose heart. Pray for me. I mean, that's what we'd expect. I'm the one in prison, but the prisoner is the encourager. The one in jail is the one that's encouraging those that are outside of jail. And he's in jail that they might know Jesus, and he doesn't want them to lose heart. There are so many things that can cause us to lose heart. It might be a a prayer that you've prayed that's delayed. The answer is delayed in coming. You know, Rebecca and myself know a prayer that we prayed over 30 years ago, probably 32 years ago. You know, it took 27, 28 years before we saw that prayer answered. But the Lord is amazing in how he has answered that. Don't lose heart. Don't lo- if you lose heart, you'll be wiped out and you will never finish. The enemy, Satan, loves to use discouragement in our faith. He loves to use discouragement in the ministry. Are these teens ever going to understand what I'm saying to them? Will they, you know, another child, another teen that's not walking with the Lord, another marriage that's failed in the church, another person who's back on drugs or alcohol. Lord, what's it all for? I don't see the fruit. And they can discourage us. I think if we're all honest, there's times in which we have been discouraged and the enemy would love to take that discouragement and change it and use it so that we would lose heart and that we would give up. Don't give up. Understand that discouragement is not from Jesus. He does not discourage. Oh, he'll convict. But do you know what conviction feels like? Conviction feels like That wasn't right. And the whole time he's saying that, you feel him drawing you into his arms. You feel him pulling you in. That's not discouragement. Discouragement is like, quit, go away. You've never been any good. God can never use anybody like that. Your mom was right when she told you you were useless. And that's discouragement. And we need to make certain that we do not lose heart, that we do not become discouraged. Jeremiah was a man called into ministry, and he had a tough one. And the Lord came to him on what I can imagine was only a day when he was discouraged. And it's in Jeremiah 12, verse 5. It says, you have run with the footmen, and they have wearied you. Then how can you contend with horses? And in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you. Then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? You know what that's saying? If the small things have wiped you out, how are you going to be ready for the big things? I found so much encouragement over the years when I was running with the footman and I was discouraged. And that verse would come to my mind and the Lord would say, don't be discouraged. One day you're going to have to run with the horses. There's going to be bigger challenges in your life. I'm like, Lord, I want to run with the horses. You know, you, you're walking a flat plane and you're tripping up and you're falling when the ground is level. What are you going to do when you're walking through the middle of the jungle? Lord, I want to walk through the jungle. I don't want to trip and fall and stay down. I want to get up. And so one of the ways in which the Lord sought to uh, encourage, discourage Jeremiah was to say, there's some great things coming and you need to buck up, soldier. You need to get ready. You need to get ready for what's coming. And you, we must encourage ourselves in the Lord. I'm going to do it. I'm going to run. You know what Jeremiah was lacking in chapter 12? 
was a Caleb spirit. Remember Joshua and Caleb? We kind of alluded to the spies that went in. Only two believed. It was Joshua and Caleb. Now, fast forward 45 years. And in life of Caleb, he had been promised that he was going to be given the mountains. Do you know what was in the mountains? The giants were in the mountains. And so they said, there was this this conversation that maybe was going on. Hey, we're, Joshua, you're an older guy. He says, listen, I'm 85, but I have the strength that I did when I was 40. I was promised the mountains where the giants were. Don't put me off in a little green pasture to just live out the rest of my days and die. I was promised the giants. I want to go fight the giants. And we need some men and women not in their own strength, not in pride and bravado that says, yeah, give me. No, but humbly say, Lord, I'll fight the giants in your name. I will go. And as you go, you're going to get tired running with the footmen. But remember, there's horses that you're going to have to run against. So don't give up now. I close with this one story, and I hope it's a, it's, a, it's a story that means so much to me because of what God has done. And in many ways, it's just representative of just the ministry that God has called me to. But you'll be able to relate it to yourself. When we had started this church, it was a small little gathering. And um, I had this office that was just a small office. I mean, it was, like, it was like this big. But there was a window, and the window looked right out into the parking lot. And I often, just excited about starting this new church, I often would look out the blinds of that window. What am I doing? I'm checking to see, is anybody coming? Are there there any cars coming? And I would close that thing. I'm like, what are you even doing? There's more cars just drove by this church in five minutes and are going to be here in the next, you know, two months. And I would be so discouraged. I'd be like, what's the point? Why did I move here? Nobody's even showing up, Lord. And the Lord would just say, like, get over it. You know, if the footman is wearing you, what are you going to do when you've got to run with the horses? And I would encourage myself, and I would walk out of that office, and I would walk in the joy and the strength of the Lord, and not a single person would ever know that I was ready to quit in that room. That was an attack from Satan on my life. And I would wrestle it through with the Lord and I would come out and nobody would ever, my wife knew, but nobody else ever knew how I felt. And that was that way for so many years. Well, that little building, we moved out of it to another one and we've since moved into another building. But that other building is only about a quarter of a mile um, away from the old building on the same road. I used to look up at that road and watch all the cars drive by. And I think more cars drove by in these last 35 seconds and then we'll pull into this parking lot in the next month. And I get discouraged. You know, (laughs) right now, in this new building that we're in, when I go and I look outside in the parking lot, do you know what I see? A traffic jam. That road is backed up. It takes people a half an hour to get into the church parking lot now. We just had to spend a lot of money to do, have a, an agency do a study to figure out how to solve the problem of the traffic. I used to look through those blinds and I wanted to quit. I felt humiliated. Like I'm a joke. What is the point of this? My, and, and the enemy tried to take me out. But now all these years later, I am so glad that the blinds didn't weary me. But that I trust in the Lord. Does that mean that's going to happen to you? No, it doesn't. Because you know what? You may never have a traffic jam in your ministry. I, I didn't think we would. You know, imagine a huge field. Because in this room, we all are working in the field of the Lord. I want you to imagine a, f- a huge field. Like an a, a agricultural um, plot of land. You can't see to the one side or the other. And, and it's harvest time. Corn, wheat, it doesn't matter what it is. But as you look in the distance, you see these three massive tractors and they're just, they're they're taking up the fruit. They're harvesting it. And there's a man who's a pastor. He's probably with the Lord now. And he had this vision and he saw these three tractors coming. 
And these were all notable men of God throughout history that were in each one of these combines. They were driving huge harvests, like Billy Graham and Billy Sunday. These people that had huge ministries. And in this vision, as he saw all this grain, which represented souls being saved, this faithful pastor said to the Lord, Lord, where is my combine? Where is my tractor? I want to be a part of this. And the Lord said, I don't have a combine for you. His son told me this story. He goes, I I don't have a combine for you. And in this vision, he was handed a sickle. And he says, I don't have a tractor for you. I have a sickle. He says, Lord, I want a combine. I want to have this ministry of seeing all these people get saved. And he says, well, I want you to look over there. And in the vision, as he looked over to this, this part of the field, it was a low part of the field, and it was hard to get in. It was only really accessible by foot. The combines couldn't get into that little part of the field. And he says, every grain of wheat is precious to me. You're not going to get a combine because a combine can't get in there. And what I've called you to do is by hand to go and harvest a small amount of wheat. And that is my plan for you. Hey, don't get caught up in whether you drive a combine or whether you're handed a sickle. Be privileged to touch anything in the kingdom of God. And if the Lord gives you a combine, then glory to him. And if he gives you a sickle, glory to the Lord. And so this is how we're going to endure in ministry. Don't lose heart. Be faithful to what God has called you to do. You're wearied with the footmen, but listen, the horses are coming. And whatever that is, I want to be able to run with them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth that we can learn and glean from this man, the Apostle Paul, sitting in prison, saying, don't be discouraged, don't lose heart. Oh, Lord, we get discouraged in our comfort. And he was sitting in prison. We pray that you would encourage us by your Holy Spirit right now. That, Lord, the the small ministry, the corner of the field that maybe we're in and wishing we were on the big tractor combine, Lord, I pray that thought would just go from us. I pray that each and every one of us would just have a sense of joy and thanksgiving. Lord, we want to go take the mountains. We want to be used by you with your power and your strength for your glory to take down the giants that hold men and women's souls captive. Lord, we surrender ourselves. We say, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we count it a privilege to touch anything in your kingdom. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.